Hi, everybody, and welcome to season four of Mark Overanalyzes Film. It's good to finally be back and very exciting to be kicking off with maybe the greatest superhero film of all time, The Dark Knight. Before I begin, allow me to remind you that I am available for story coaching and reading and story editing at MarkOveranalyzesStory.com. The Dark Knight was directed by Christopher Nolan and he co-wrote the screenplay with his brother Jonathan Nolan from a story that he also co-wrote, but with David S. Goyer. Now, there is a lot to get into with The Dark Knight and it's a fairly complicated narrative, so I'd like to set up some stuff before I really dive in. First of all, I love this film, but I know that people complain that it kind of feels like a film and a half shoved into one. And I can see where those people are coming from. Don't get me wrong, I'm pretty sure that it does have something to do with the fact that there's so much going on, and also that the plot of this film is actually bananas. But mostly, I think it comes from the fact that there's an awkward kind of transition between Act 2 and Act 3, with a sort of strange twilight sequence between the two, as we'll see. The second big thing to set up is just how this story works. As far as I'm concerned, there are really three main characters, right? There's Bruce Wayne, there's Joker, and there's Harvey Dent. Now, you could argue which out of those three is the protagonist of this story, but as far as I'm concerned, this is, in real story structure nerd terms, what we might call a two-dimensional story based around Bruce Wayne. What that means is the whole story is applying pressure on Bruce Wayne to change and asking, can he possibly survive or stay the same or maintain the status quo or, you know, whatever in the face of all of this pressure? So what we want here is for Bruce Wayne slash Batman to stand for something. And we want to put something completely oppositional against him. and then have that oppositional force apply as much pressure as possible. So, against this billionaire who is fighting to maintain order, the Dark Knight introduces a psychopathic clown who inspires chaos, who appears to have no worldly needs, and who literally burns money. Joker even sort of makes fun of the whole idea of a backstory which is so important to Batman. So Joker really is the perfect nemesis for Batman. But also, a potential problem for two-dimensional stories is that if they are all about maintaining the status quo, they can be in danger of feeling episodic. In fact, they are mostly used for episodic, you know, TV shows and things like that. Every episode of CSI or whatever is going to be a two-dimensional story where the status quo is maintained. This is also partly why, I think, so many superhero films can feel kind of boring. So what we need is someone or something that feels genuinely important that does change. We still need that sense of change within our story. Something that can work as a proxy or a personification for a thematic argument or a struggle. Enter Harvey Dent. So, Bruce Wayne begins by shouldering all of the responsibility for saving Gotham, but he is hoping to hand that off to Harvey. When Joker destroys Harvey though, Bruce is forced to embrace the fact that the responsibility remains his and his alone. It is a classic two-dimensional story. So, our story works like this then. Batman and Joker facing each other, an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object, but Harvey is neither unstoppable nor immovable. So the thematic back and forth of the story is really traced or tracked by following how close Harvey is to either Batman or Joker. Okay, so with all that in mind, first I'll look at the fundamental features of the protagonist, and then I'll go through the main story beats by looking at the sequences of the film. Then I'll talk about the main things I learned along the way. So. Let's begin with the five questions about the protagonist. Question one, whose story is it? Or basically, who is the protagonist? Again, it's debatable, but as far as I'm concerned, this film really revolves around the question, 
can Bruce Wayne prevail? And so this is his story to my mind. Question two, what is their life dream? Life dream here refers to what it is that the protagonist wants or is aiming to do when the film begins and the story has, you know, yet to really properly get going. When we start The Dark Knight, Batman is still fighting crime. But Bruce at least claims that he wants out. He is hoping that Harvey can save Batman and that Harvey's girlfriend Rachel can save Bruce Wayne. That is his life dream. And as we can see, it is all wrapped up in Harvey. Question three, what is their want? Want here is what the character is trying to achieve in act two of the film. From the moment they really begin their journey, about 25 minutes in, until the moment that they are at their, you know, normally their most defeated, about 20 to 25 minutes from the end. The whole point of this is really to give the character something to do and to give shape to the story. As such, the want is a smart goal in that it is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Now, this is a grey area to my mind. I think The Dark Knight does have a kind of a wonky shape to it. Whether you care to assign the want to Harvey or Bruce though, the smart goal that kicks off this whole adventure I think is Bruce, Harvey and Gordon want to keep Lau in prison and safe long enough to testify against the mob. That is really the objective that they set off with about 25 minutes in and generally give some kind of shape to the story. Question 4. What is their need? Now in what John York calls a three-dimensional story, wherein a protagonist needs to change, need is the human quality or piece of wisdom that the character lacks at the beginning of the story. But again, this is a two-dimensional story, right? So it's not that the protagonist needs to change, like in a three-dimensional story. Rather, they need to stay the same against tremendous pressure to change. So in this case, need is the human quality or piece of wisdom that the character already has at the beginning, and they must maintain throughout. And really, The Dark Knight goes at a big question in this regard, right? Now, you could probably phrase it any number of ways, but, you know, it's something in this area, right, of a question that the Joker is raising. How strong is anyone's moral fortitude? Is Joker right when he says that we're all just animals that will eat each other when the chips are down? Could we take someone as quote-unquote good as Harvey Dent and turn them into a monster? If Batman has just one rule... Can he be goaded into breaking it? Can we really truly stand for anything? Will Batman die a hero or live long enough to see himself become the villain? At least to this last question, I think we do have an answer. And that is neither. Batman has actually such moral fortitude that he will allow himself to appear villainous without committing villainy. He is not the hero. He is something more. And that is what he needs to maintain. Question five then is, do they get what they want and or what they need? And well, we shall see. Okay, so now that I've attempted to answer the five key questions, let's have a look at the Dark Knight's sequences. Now, there are normally eight stages, let's say, in a film. In classic films, every stage pretty much used to be comprised of one sequence. But in modern films, you know, kind of from the last few decades, we tend to have more, but these sequences still fit into these eight stages. So, for example, The Dark Knight still has eight stages, but I'd say there are really ten sequences. A sequence is a combination of scenes that are tied together by having a single overriding dramatic question or tension, and they tend to be between 10 and 15 minutes in length or so. Now, a good way to think about it is that basically every 10 to 15 minutes, the audience should be on some level asking themselves a different dramatic question. We start with sequence one, life as it is. And I do want to spend just a little extra time on this sequence, because it's really damn good. 
this sequence is dominated by two set pieces, which I find really interesting. And this is one of those things where I just wonder how I've watched a film so many times and never registered something so obvious and important. Because these two set pieces, Joker robbing the mob bank and Batman foiling a drug deal, are mirror images of each other. Which again, is really obvious and I don't know how I never saw it before. Joker and Batman both reveal themselves well into their respective set pieces, while people dressed up as them run around emulating them. But while Joker is committing a crime and Batman is foiling a crime, Joker is also purposely stoking the copycatism, while Batman is trying to put the kibosh on his own copycats. Furthermore, on Joker's set piece, there is a lot of foreshadowing going on. At the end of the bank heist, he removes a clown mask to reveal a clown mask. This is such a great, simple, visual evocation of the central idea of this character. There is nothing beneath this. This is the limit of who or what this thing is. He is an agent of chaos and only an agent of chaos. There's nothing under the mask except for maybe another mask. And that is what makes him so unsettling. Finally, by contrast to Batman defining himself by the fact that he has his own tank and that he is not wearing cheap hockey pads, Joker makes his escape in a school bus. Perhaps we could all be Batman if we were billionaires, but Joker's on the streets. And this sort of inevitably raises the question, is there something more real about Joker? Does he better reflect more people and their experiences? Well, we'll see. Because after we catch up with our protagonist and antagonist, we have our inciting incident, or the event without which our story as it is would not happen. So Harvey Dent has introduced himself and his lucky coin. He meets Lieutenant Gordon and reluctantly agrees to sign a warrant to raid the banks that the mob are using to hold their money. This will lead to Lau taking it all into one big pot, which will lead to Batman, you know, kidnapping a foreign national on their own soil, which is cool when America does it. This will lead to Dent locking up 549 criminals all at once on a RICO charge. This will lead to a desperate mob hiring Joker, and this will lead to everything else. But for now, the cops move in on the banks, only to discover that the dirty money has been moved. Now, it's worth noting here something else that I didn't really credit for a long time. Harvey is 100% correct about Gordon's outfit being dirty, and Joker is only able to do everything he does because he's working with the mob, because Gordon clearly trusts Ramirez, and Ramirez and Wirtz are owned by the mob. Unwilling to face this, Gordon accuses Dent's office of being leaky, so Harvey does actually have pretty good reason to be angry with Gordon later on. Anyways, I should say we are well into sequence two at this stage because we have had our inciting incident and things are in motion after that. So Joker makes his iconic pitch to the mob and then we enter act two once our trio finally converges. About 25 minutes in, Batman finally meets Harvey Dent and he is furious because Lau has absconded with all the dirty money, so this triumvirate concoct a plan. I almost had your rookie cold on a racketeering beat. Don't try and cloud the fact that clearly Maroney's got people in your office, Dent. We need Lau back. But the Chinese won't extradite a national under any circumstances. If I get him to you, can you get him to talk? I'll get him to sing. We're going after the mob's life savings. Things will get ugly. I knew the risk when I took this job, Lieutenant. Batman will obtain Lau, which is our next sequence tension. Then Gordon will arrest him, and Dent will make him testify. That is our hero's objective that will drive the majority of our story. So at that, we end Act 1, and we enter Act 2. Now, Act 2 always begins with our third sequence, the first attempts to solve the problem. In a three-dimensional story where the protagonist needs to change, this sequence is defined by a refusal of the call to change, before ending with an acceptance of that call. 
So a two-dimensional story is a little different though. Rather than a growing awareness of a change that needs to be made, the protagonist slowly comes to realize the true nature of what they are up against. And so throughout this sequence, everything seems to be operating along, you know, regular enough parameters, right? Batman catches Lau while working hand in glove with Harvey, who in turn is operating within the accepted legal framework. His big plan is to mount a RICO case. At the same time, the mob initially refuses to work with Joker because they are as yet insufficiently desperate and Gamble hates him. But this all changes at the end of this sequence, when we have our acceptance of the call. Joker murders Gamble, the Chechen reveals he has decided to hire Joker, and the mayor warns Dent what is coming, and how hard it will be. You can hear it, right? You can see how everything starts to ramp up and escalate at the same time as we move from the third sequence to the fourth. The first attempts to solve the problem have not worked. And so in our next stage, which has sequences four and five in it, we have the greater attempts to solve the problem. Lau has been apprehended, but Joker has emerged as the driving force of antagonism by slamming a fake Batman against the mayor's window and sharing a video demanding that the real Batman unmask himself. But more pressingly, Joker has included a playing card on the fake Batman's body and it has three DNA samples. The judges from the Lau case, the police chiefs and Harvey Dent's. So we have a new tension. Can Batman save Dent? And so we enter sequence four. As luck would have it, Bruce Wayne is throwing a fundraiser for Harvey. So while the judge goes up in flames and the police chief is poisoned, Wayne realizes that Joker and his goons have come for Dent and decides to slip into something more armor-plated. Joker fails to catch Harvey, but escapes after Batman is forced to throw himself out the window after Rachel. So Joker has killed two out of three, but Bruce has at least succeeded in saving Dent. And note, once again here, at the end of this sequence, our hero's awareness increases again, right? After saving Dent, Bruce tells Alfred the criminals are not complicated. All you need to do is find out what motivates them. And Alfred iconically corrects Bruce. One day, I saw a child playing with a ruby the size of a tangerine. The bandit had been throwing them away. So why still? Well, because he thought it was good sport, because some men aren't looking for anything logical, like money. They can't be bought, bullied, reasoned, or negotiated with. Some men just want to watch the world burn. At that, we move quickly into sequence five, as Joker threatens to kill the mayor this time, and we wonder if Batman can find the Joker before he does so. So the sense of chaos is really building now and the film creates this sense that, you know, Gotham can't protect anyone from Joker. It eventually turns out that Gordon can, but only by sacrificing himself. But by now, from a story structure perspective, we're really approaching our all-important midpoint. At the midpoint of a three-dimensional story, the protagonist makes their first conscious move towards their need. In other words, you know, they make a huge step towards the change that they will eventually need to make. So Michael Corleone kills someone for the first time, Harry and Sally almost kiss for the first time. But in a two-dimensional story, again, that huge step is still there, but it has much more to do with an awareness of the situation. For example, Ripley encounters the alien for the first time. But also the midpoint, almost always signposts or foreshadows our climax. Now that's a lot to do, right? But great stories do it really elegantly. So you mostly wouldn't notice unless you go looking for it. Or, you know, unless you're a story freak like me. So what's going on around here, the midpoint, in the dark night? Well, we're not quite there yet, but one of our trio of heroes lies dead, 
Harvey's angry and reckless side is revealing itself as he threatens Joker's henchmen, and Bruce decides that he will sacrifice himself for the greater good, while Alfred insists that what Batman needs to do is take the blame and keep going. Batman must endure. And all of this is going to sound very familiar very soon. For now though, Bruce has decided to turn himself in, but then, 68 minutes in to a 137 minute runtime, almost exactly halfway, we have the true midpoint. Later on, in the climax of our story, Batman is going to lie and take the place of Harvey. At the midpoint of our story, Harvey lies and takes the place of Batman. That is neat, isn't it? Furthermore, Rachel understandably upset that, you know, her ex-boyfriend is letting her current boyfriend take his place in prison, asks Alfred what the hell Bruce is doing, and Alfred foreshadows Gordon's final speech. I am the Batman. Why is he letting Harvey do this? He went down to the press conference. I know, and he just stood by. Perhaps both Bruce and Mr. Dent believe that Batman stands for something more important than the whims of a terrorist, Miss Dawes. Batman isn't a hero, he's something more. Then, Rachel gives Alfred a letter for Bruce. It is not good news. It looks like the future of Bruce and Batman, whatever it's going to be, is going to be a lonely one. So, I mean, you can see it, right? You can hear it. You can see just how much we're being told here is going to happen at the end of this film. Just how much is foreshadowed. It's really quite incredible. For now, though, we have to wonder, can Batman keep Harvey safe? And so we move into sequence six, the honeymoon sequence. And what a goddamn humdinger of a sequence it is. The honeymoon sequence is so called because having made this, you know, big step towards their need or some greater knowledge, things start to go well for the protagonist as a kind of reward. Now, things are not obviously going super well, you might argue here, as Harvey is locked up and a sitting duck for Joker. But this is the one sequence in the entire film where the heroes are actually ahead of Joker. Joker doesn't know Harvey isn't Batman, and he doesn't know Gordon isn't dead. Also, remember that how well things are going is generally shown to us by how close Batman and Harvey are, and in this sequence, again, they are hand in glove. So, as predicted, Joker turns up in a truck and tries to take down the SWAT van, but the trio of heroes combine to capture him. So, the sequence tension is answered. Yes, Batman has been able to keep Harvey safe, but this sequence ends with an intriguing moment. As Batman drives right at him on his bat pod, Joker urges Batman to hit him. And Batman obviously wants to, right? But at the last minute he swerves, hitting a truck, and knocking himself out. Now, if Batman hits him, it's murder. The one thing Batman will not do. On the other hand, if he hits him, Rachel lives, and Harvey remains Harvey. Is this in the honeymoon sequence? Because it is Batman tested to the nth degree and maintaining his principles? Or does it end the honeymoon sequence? Because we sense his unwillingness to kill Joker will lead to more problems. Both things are probably true. The honeymoon period ends and gives way to the bridge to the low point because there are limits to the need or the truth that the protagonist has learned. At least there are at this point. And so we do enter that bridge to the low point. We quickly discover Harvey never made it home, and we have to wonder if Bruce will be able to find him. And so we enter sequence 7. Now, before I started analysing The Dark Knight, I assumed that the midpoint of the film was probably the scene where Batman interrogates Joker. 
That was partly because the Dark Knight is so clearly influenced by Heat, which has the famous midpoint of De Niro and Pacino meeting halfway through, but also because, well again, midpoints often reveal the true nature of the problem. And this is where Batman comes face to face with Joker and his philosophy. But having this meeting here at the bridge to the low point actually makes perfect sense. Batman has had a moment of triumph. And the reason for that is that Harvey did a selfless noble thing to assist him. So we need the counter argument to come back in strong and fast to keep things interesting. And here it comes. Joker pretty much tells Gordon to his face that his men are betraying him. And he asks if it's depressing being so alone. When Batman turns up, he tells him that the only reasonable way to live is to have no rules, to live in chaos. But of course, Joker knows that Batman has one rule, no killing. So Joker plays a game. He gives Batman the addresses where Harvey and Rachel are tied to explosives. If Batman chooses to save one, he will be, according to some very specious logic by the Joker, killing the other. Now, skipping over the fact that none of this makes any sense whatsoever, Batman chooses to go save Rachel, but with a cooler head, perhaps he would have guessed the Joker switched the addresses. So Batman saves Dent, or half of him at least, but Gordon does not make it in time to save Rachel. As a result, Bruce has technically managed to achieve the sequence's aim, but at tremendous cost. At the same time, Joker has escaped the major crimes unit and sprung Lau into the bargain. Now, this is a point of the Dark Knight that is of particular interest to me, and I'd like to come back and explain why I find it so interesting later. Actually, there's probably a case to say this could easily be the end of the film. It would be a 92-minute film, and what a great 92-minute film it would be. But at the very least, let me say that this absolutely feels like it should be the end of Act 2. I was meant to inspire good, not... Madness, not death. You have inspired good, but you spat in the faces of Gotham's criminals. Didn't you think there might be some casualties? Things were always going to get worse before they got better. But Rachel, Alfred... Rachel believed in what you stood for. What we stand for. Gotham needs you. No, Gotham needs its true hero. And I let that murdering psychopath blow him half to hell. But our final act has not actually begun yet. Rather, we enter what I can only see as a kind of weird twilight sequence, our eighth, where the lawyer, Reese, is set to reveal who Batman really is, and Joker decides he doesn't actually want to know. For one thing, he doesn't need to know anymore because his mission with the mob is now complete. So Joker kills Lau and tells Gotham to kill Reese for him, or he'll blow up a hospital. So we have our tension here, can Bruce save Reese? Which is a great tension because, you know, you've got this real damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of idea. And it's always fascinating when you've got those tensions and you have to figure out how the hero could possibly navigate it. But while Bruce is doing that, Joker is busy visiting Harvey Dent in hospital. Now, Dent's transformation and the fact that Joker can convince him not to put a bullet in his head is the weakest part of this story for me. But, you know, I don't know, structurally, you can see why it's here, right? For the overall sake of the story, for the theme of the story, you can see why it's here. Because when Joker blows up the hospital and declares that the city is his, while Harvey embraces his two-faced persona... We are at our thematic low point. Remember, at the midpoint when things took an upturn, Harvey was inspired by Batman. At the low point, though, he is inspired by Joker. If Joker can turn him, maybe he can turn anyone. And maybe that means that Joker is right and Batman is wrong. And so at that, we end Act 2 and we enter Act 3. Act 3 always has a false resolution and a true resolution. So Joker runs an experiment where two boats are rigged with explosives and they are asked to kill each other. And it looks for all the world like one of them will do just that. 
even though I'm totally sure that they have the detonators for their own explosives. But anyways, at the same time, Bruce is kind of having his own false resolution. In Act 1, famously, Harvey uses Roman dictators as an example that you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Just before our midpoint, Bruce told Rachel that he sees what he would have to become in order to stop someone like Joker, and he won't do it. But here, in our false resolution, Bruce reveals that he has designed a method of spying on the entire city. He is soon fighting the cops in order to protect hostages that look very much like henchmen, and if Bruce is going to go all-out dictator, this would be his jumping off point. Joker might be right, people have no real morals, at least not ones that can't be monstrously twisted. So, it's about time then for our true resolution to kick in. Despite every motivation to do so, nobody can actually bring themselves to pull the trigger and blow up a boatload of other people. Batman might be struggling to inspire the good in Gotham, but Joker has not inspired the mayhem and a moralism he hoped to. Then, Batman surprises Joker and sends him falling to his death. But, in the face of everything, Batman somehow retains his one rule. He will not let Joker die. And Joker has to hand it to him. Uh, 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 you. You just couldn't let me go, could you? This is what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. You truly are incorruptible, aren't you? Huh? But if we left it there, we would have gone all this way just to sort of arrive at the same position. So we need to go further. Harvey has kidnapped Gordon's family, he has become completely convinced by Joker's worldview, and Batman does end up having to kill him to stop him shooting Gordon's child. And then, we finish with Bruce's ultimate sacrifice. Just as Harvey assumed his place at the midpoint, Batman assumes Harvey's place now. Because just like Harvey then, Bruce realises the value of a lie. In the face of tremendous pressure, Bruce has somehow managed to maintain his moral fortitude. And why? Because he can take it. Because he's not a hero. He's a silent guardian. A watchful protector. Dark Knight. As ever, there's about a hundred things I'd like to talk about here, but I'm going to limit myself to what I find most interesting about the Dark Knight. And that is really why the Dark Knight's structure feels a bit messy, and why I think it's still a great film despite that. So first, what I consider to be an issue of overall story structure and what I'm going to call compounding the stakes. When I analysed Star Wars A New Hope, I talked about Michael Arndt's analysis of why that ending is, to use his term, insanely great. What's important for us here is that Arndt has this very compelling theory that there are essentially three sets of stakes in a really good film. External, internal, and philosophical. Now, I would really recommend anybody to go look up Michael Arndt's website, pandemoniuminc.com, and watch his videos, they're really good. But essentially, external stakes are, you know, tangible or visible. They might be staying alive, or winning the race, or saving the world, or, you know, something like that. Internal stakes are really, you know, what you might consider emotional stakes. Falling in love, or finding friendship, or gaining self-confidence, maybe. The philosophical stakes are really what I would generally consider maybe thematic stakes, or the argument or life lesson that the film gives us. So we should, you know, live selflessly, or enjoy every day, or believe in ourselves, or, you know, whatever it might be. 
Now, Arndt mostly focuses on how this relates to landing the ending in his videos, but of course if these stakes are to mean anything, they have to be present throughout our story, and ideally they should be all wrapped up with each other, or compounded if you will, even if they're not necessarily all pulling in the same direction. Now that might sound a little bit confusing, so let's take the example of Star Wars A New Hope. At the end of Act 2, Luke saves the princess, which is his external goal, but in the moment of escape, his mentor Obi-Wan sacrifices himself so that the young heroes can flee to freedom. Obi-Wan was the first person to really believe in Luke, and had literally been called their only hope. So his death is not only a personal or internal kind of gut punch to Luke, but a real thematic blow for the argument of the film. And this is, you know, quite common in low points that they don't all necessarily move in the same direction. Of course, sometimes they do. But what often happens is the main character gets what they want, only to discover that it's not the main thing that they need. But the point is that all of these stakes are, you know, really wrapped up together. And they hit some kind of climax or apotheosis or whatever at the same time. That's because there shouldn't really be any gap between our protagonist and their story. So, for example, their low point should be the low point of the story. And so the external, internal and thematic low point should all come at the same time. The Dark Knight is just not that neat. And that's because in The Dark Knight, I think at least, there's a kind of slip or gap or something in the frame between these three stakes. The end of sequence 7 feels like it contains the big external and internal punch for Bruce, right? It's really his low point there. Joker has absconded with Lau and killed Rachel. Bruce wants to protect Gotham, but he couldn't achieve his external objective of protecting Lau, and he's personally devastated by the idea not only that the love of his life has been murdered, but he might have brought it on them. We feel really that this is Bruce at his lowest ebb. But as far as the story is concerned, we are not at the nadir of the philosophical stakes. So we have another sequence to finish the second act, where Joker declares Gotham to be his and, most importantly, turns Harvey to his side of the argument. While he's doing this, Batman dabbles with totalitarian controls. But here's the thing, I don't care nearly as much as I cared just a few minutes ago about Bruce dealing with the death of Rachel. The end of sequence 7 feels like it should be the end of Act 2, really. As great as this 8 sequence is in and of itself, and there's, you know, loads of great and fun stuff in it, in terms of the overall structure of the story, it feels a bit messy and kinda lets some air out of the balloon. Now, as Arndt suggests, that philosophical stake, or those philosophical stakes, however you want to call it, is what really provides extra meaning to a story and makes it truly great, and I totally agree. But we will never really viscerally care about the thematic stakes as an audience as much as the external and internal stakes, because we are so invested in the personal story of the protagonist. So when the Dark Knight shows Bruce devastated by the loss of Rachel, but then kind of continues the act by focusing on the turning to madness of somebody else? of Harvey? Well, it's not really about Bruce so much anymore, and that's who I'm really invested in, so it's a bit anticlimactic and a bit messy. Okay, Mark, but this is one of the best-reviewed films of all time. It made over a billion dollars, and it was so important that it changed the Oscars. That's all true, and it is not by accident. The Dark Knight is a great movie, and Christopher Nolan is a hell of a director. The tension, the pacing, the set pieces are unbelievable. But more than that, despite being a bit out of whack at the end of Act 2, I still think what makes The Dark Knight actually so special are those thematic or philosophical stakes that feel so heightened by Joker. 
I don't think it is any coincidence that my favourite Nolan films are The Prestige and The Dark Knight. The Prestige was an adaptation of a Christopher Priest novel, and The Dark Knight is really an adaptation of two of the best Batman comics, The Killing Joke and The Long Halloween. It was also co-written with David S. Goyer, and there's something in either adapting those materials, or maybe working with a co-writer that isn't another Nolan, or both, that adds clarity of motivation and thematic heft to the cleverness and the pacing and the spectacle and the exposition that Nolan always brings. And this really is embodied, to my mind, in Joker. Now, I've often heard that The Dark Knight is an okay film with a great villain performance in it, which is a facile thing to say, I think. One, because it sort of falls into that category that annoys me of people assuming the films don't have writers really and actors just make it up as they go along. So Heath Ledger just turned to Christopher Nolan and said, you know, what if I said something like, it's all part of the plan? And Nolan responded, sure, I was just going to have you sing I'm an evil teapot short and stout, but that's better, I guess. Two, because any film, especially any superhero film, is defined by its villain. As Hitchcock famously said, the more successful the villain, the more successful the picture. Three, if you saw this in a cinema and you didn't get excited by the Hans Zimmer soundtrack, the chase sequence, and the now famous final moments, I can't help you. I don't understand. But, checking my rant there, what The Dark Knight does fantastically well is present the hero, who represents an idea or a philosophy, with something or someone diametrically opposed to them, and then convince us, the audience, that that antagonistic force might just be more powerful or worse more true than what the hero represents. Then, eventually, the original idea represented by the hero will win in a way that is both against the odds and thematically evincing. So, Joker is everything that Batman is not, and then he plunges the city into a terrified, panicked chaos, and we really wonder if Joker is showing us that society is a bad joke, and that when the chips are down, life really is a war of each against all. By creating an atmosphere of fear and desperation, he appears to be able to turn everyone into self-interested, morally bankrupt, base actors. And it's pretty convincing, right? But then, finally, just as it seems that Joker really has the truest insight into the human condition, when it comes to the climactic moment, people will not kill each other, even when they have reason to. Batman, as our representation of moral fortitude and selfless sacrifice, proves a truly immovable object. Somewhere, under the societal norms, there is this sweaty, desperate self-interest in us. But, in amongst it, perhaps within it, perhaps underneath it, somewhere, there is a drive and a will and a conviction to believe in good, to believe in the common good, to believe in something bigger than ourselves. What makes The Dark Knight special then is that it attests not just Batman himself, but what Batman represents to its absolute limit. It tests Bruce Wayne and Batman externally, internally, and philosophically. And then, what makes those final moments so exciting is that with every excuse to just do the easier thing, with every reason to let Joker fall to his death, and to have Harvey take the blame for the things that Harvey has done, not only does Batman endure, but we believe in him. This has been Mark Overanalyze's film on The Dark Knight. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, rate, follow, recommend, and whatever else it is that's good for this kind of thing. Thanks for listening, take care of yourselves, and see you soon.